In the world of computer programming, programs are written in one of many different programming languages. The purpose of a programming language, such as C, C++, Java, C Sharp, Objective-C, and many others, is to give us humans a way to talk to the computer. This is a necessary step, since computers only really understand zeros and ones, and as human beings it would be impossible, or at the very least terribly confusing, to have to write entire programs in zeros and ones. In order to take the human readable source code we write and have the computer understand it then, we need a way to convert it into zeros and ones, otherwise known as machine code. This is where the compilation or translation process comes into play. You can think of the translation process consisting of four different steps. The preprocessing stage, the compilation stage, the machine code generation stage, and the linking stage. Keep in mind in this lesson, we'll be focusing on this process and its relationship to languages which are typically compiled versus languages that are typically interpreted. While there are a lot of similarities between the two, the overall processes are not mirror images of each other. For the differences between compiling a language and interpreting a language, click the link above. Moving on, the preprocessing stage consists of copying and pasting. That's right. The preprocessor, the program normally responsible for the preprocessing stage, will literally cut code from a specific place, usually a file, and paste it into another place or another file. The compilation stage deals with, in most cases, the generation of assembly code, and there are many stages involved in the translation of source code into assembly code. Once assembly code is generated, the next step is that of the machine code generation, which of course takes the assembly code spit out in the compilation stage and then translates it to all the zeros and ones necessary for your program to run on the CPU. Finally, there's the linking stage, which deals with taking all of your code and gluing it together into one beautiful program executable file. Now, sometimes each stage is handled by a separate program, which passes things on to the next program, and sometimes multiple stages are handled by one program with multiple built-in functionalities. It really depends on the engineers crafting these programs. For example, the compiler is a program that is often credited with the producing of machine code output files. However, sometimes the compiler will defer this process to what's known as an assembler. Again, it all depends on the context and what the developer of these programs want their compilers or linkers or whatever to do. What's really important for this lesson, however, is just familiarizing yourself with the typical stages of converting source code into an actual running program on your computer. For better familiarization then, let's dive a bit deeper into each of these processes, starting with the preprocessing stage. So much preprocess, I can't speak anymore. In normal source code compilation, the preprocessing stage consists of using what is known as a lexical preprocessor. This is a program which basically just performs simple substitutions at marked areas in the source code. For example, in C and C++, the hash symbol, or the number symbol, whatever you want to call it, followed by some character sequence such as include, define, if def, or whatever, known as preprocessor directives, let the preprocessor know that we want to use its powers in some way at this point. Let's take a look at some source code to help explain. Here, once we are finished writing our code and hit the build button, the preprocessor will run first. As it scans the document, it will first run into these hash include directives at the top. This directive signals to the preprocessor to go out and find this file on our computer, which is known as a header file, copy the contents of that file, and then paste them right here, directly into our current file. So hash include now gets replaced by whatever code was found in the corresponding header file. After doing so, the preprocessor will continue to scan our file for any more directives. In this case, we also have this hash define directive. The hash define directive has the preprocessor perform a substitution in a slightly different way than the hash include. Instead of going out and finding a file and pasting the contents of that file right here, the hash define says find any place within our code that has this series of characters and replace it with this code. In this case, this is known as a macro. So the preprocessor is responsible for preparing our code base for compilation by including and substituting code in the places we, the programmers, define. This is useful because it's easier for us human beings to look through code in smaller chunks rather than having one long file with thousands and thousands of lines of code, especially when we only want to observe one section of that code and not the entire code base. 
Now we have the compilation stage, which is normally performed by what is known as the compiler program. Remember, this stage of development is responsible for generating optimized assembly code from our source code. Just to be thorough though, not all compilers have to translate code and assembly code, and some don't, but generally this is the case. If you're not familiar with assembly code, then just realize it's another programming language, but it's a language that's a lot closer to the machine, meaning that you have much more control in assembly as you can specify and access individual registers on a CPU and a lot of other different things. So you might be wondering then, why don't we just write our programs in assembly? Well, it's much harder to write code in assembly language than it is in something like C++. Also, there is really no point since the compiler nowadays is able to generate assembly code from our original source code that is better than pretty much anything we humans could write. The transition from source to assembly in a compiler is generally broken up into a few of its own stages. The first stage, or the front end stage of a compiler, deals with the analysis of your code. At the analysis stage, the compiler reads through your program source, breaks it up into smaller elements, checks for correctness of code, and then if there are errors, this will cease compilation and spit out the errors to you. If no errors are found, then the compiler proceeds to generate what's known as intermediate representation code. Converting your source code into an IR language first is useful because it's much easier for the compiler to optimize IR language than it is to optimize straight assembly code. Don't worry about the why right now, just know that it is. So once the compiler has checked your code, converted it into intermediate representation, optimized the IR, the IR is now ready to be converted into assembly in the second stage or back end of the compiler. Now we don't need to get into too much detail here, but basically in this stage, variables are mapped to registers and assignments are translated into their corresponding instruction codes. And there are some little minor CPU specific optimizations that occur in order to squeeze every bit of performance out of your program. Now that we have all our code translated in assembly and optimized for max performance, it's time to convert it into machine code. As stated before, sometimes this step is performed by the compiler and sometimes it's passed on to what's known as an assembler. Whatever the case, converting assembly code into machine code is a bit more straightforward and really isn't worth going into too much detail in this lesson. If you'd like to know more about the relationship between assembly code and machine code and how one might be easily translated to the other, I will create a video soon here for that. And if I'm done with it and you're watching this video right now, I'll put up the link. And if nothing came up for you, then sorry, I haven't quite gotten to it yet. For now, the biggest thing to know is that after this step, we have our zeros and ones, our machine code instructions. At this point, you might be thinking this should be the last step, right? We have our machine code, so what else is there to do? Well, we have to remember exactly what is going on here and how our source code was actually set up. In most all modern languages, our source code is broken up into many separate files, typically header and source files. In C++, for example, your header files end with a .h extension and your source files end in a .cpp extension. In C, the header files are the same with .h and the source files end in .c. Remember though, the preprocessor will generally take your .h files and copy and paste their contents within the source files themselves, since every source file at the bare minimum needs to include its corresponding header file. During the preprocessing stage then, all of our header files will go away and what we are left with are our source files. These are the files then that are gonna be compiled and translated into machine code. Once this translation occurs, our source files are now known as object files. And typically object files are expressed with a .o or .obj extension. Now we have potentially, depending on the size of our program, thousands of separate object files which contain machine code instructions. Obviously, if we wanted to make a functional running program, we need to combine these files into a single executable file, which is where the linker comes into play. The linker is a program that is responsible for the linking process. Now, there is usually a separate linker program for which the compiler or assembler will hand off their resulting code. One of the major jobs of the linker is to find and match all function declarations and definitions. Why would we need to do this, you ask? Well, in code, you often call functions in one source file for which the definition of is in another source file. The linker will scan through and match up each function declaration and definition so that your program knows what to do at runtime when it runs into a certain function during execution.
in the end of the linking process, all the functions are properly set up and everything is placed and linked into one executable file. Which, for Windows computers, you will often notice this file with the .exe extension. And for Mac, I believe, would be the .app file. I'm not 100% sure because I'm not really a Mac user. Anyway, this is the translation process in a nutshell. This is the process of taking your human-readable source code and converting it into machine code ready for the CPU to execute. Hopefully, you now have a better idea of what exactly happens when you hit that all-important build button within your IDE.